Hi, I'm Miranda Wright, and this is day 63 of our 120-day Upper Room Prayer Campaign. And today, we're going to pray for desperation because we want to see miracles. We want to see salvations. We want to see deliverances, and that is going to take desperation. The Word of God says that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will heal their land. But my friend, that will only come from a spirit of desperation because oftentimes it is only a state of desperation that will drive people to praying, to humbling, to turning away from those things which are pleasing to their flesh. It also says that when the people of God, the ministers of the Lord, and that word minister literally means servant, so that encompasses all of us because we are all called to minister in some form or fashion. You don't have to stand behind a pulpit to be a minister of the Lord. Anyone who is truly a servant of the Lord should minister to others or unto the Lord in prayer in some form of fashion. So it says that if those who are the servants of the Lord will weep between the porch and the altar and cry out, out in desperation, Lord, let not thy name be made a reproach. Let not your heritage be overtaken by the enemy. It comes from a place of desperation that the church will begin to cry out in true intercession and start pleading before the Lord God Almighty for a move that will set things back in the right direction. My friend, we need to cultivate a mindset of desperation when it comes to the things of God. I think if we truly had a revelation of the destination of eternity if we truly had eternity set in our heart we would live in a state of desperation to see the nation saved to see people delivered and set free to see the glory of God manifested that all might see and believe and glorify him as the king my friend it's time to get desperate we have a good friend, a minister who we've been close to for very many years and, and he's from India where things are very dire and desperate and even dangerous for Christians. And he told me one time when he was here in the States, he said, you know, it's hard to explain, but it's very difficult to believe for miracles here. He said, in India, we live by miracles. We see them every day. But when you come to America, you just depend on so many other things that it's hard to believe for a miracle. And I don't understand it. And I told him, my friend, it's because of desperation. Because in your nation, there is a desperation which drives people to pray. And that prayer pulls the power of the kingdom down to meet their need. Here we don't see it because we don't think we need it. And so we depend on every other thing. We depend on money. We depend on promotions. We depend on personality. We depend on presentations. We depend on organizations. We depend on talent. We depend on the doctors. We depend on the government. We can depend on anything and everything so that we don't need to depend on God. So there's no desperation so that the people are not on their knees. My friend, it is prayer that changes things. And it's sad to say that oftentimes people will not cry out to the Lord God Almighty until they are in need, until they have become desperate. And this is why we see throughout history the cycle that God's people continually went through where they were constantly being brought back into captivity by the enemy so that they would come to a place of humility and desperation that they would start to pray and call out to the king. My friend, we do not need to come to that place if we will humble ourselves now, bend the knee, and cry out in desperate prayer. Because if you don't do it willingly, you will do it by necessity. Because this is the way of things. And my friend, this nation truly does have a need. We've just been blinded to it. We don't see it because we're so distracted by so many other things. It's time to put the phone down. It's time to turn the TV off. It's time to walk away from the sports games and the restaurants. It's time to put down all of the books written by man. Close the door and get shut in. Get on your knees and cry out to God so that he can come and heal 
this land. It's only going to happen by a move of the Spirit of God. It's not going to happen by any other means. So stop making them the priority. Get on your knees and cry unto the Lord. He can do it. He is more than able, but he will not do it until we get desperate enough to cry out to him so that he gets glory for it in the end. The reason we see such miracle manifestations in other nations is because they are desperate and desperate people pray and they have faith because they have to. The problem here is that we have faith in everything but. When you have no money, you have to have faith in God. You can't put your faith in money. When you don't have access to a doctor, you got to put your faith in God and cry out and pray and press through because you can't put your faith in medicine. When you don't even know where your next meal is coming from, you got to have faith and start crying out in desperation. When your very life is at risk for the faith that you are proclaiming, you've got to move in a place of prayer and connectivity to the Father because there is a need, because of desperation. And my friend, tribulation is going to come upon this earth to bring the church back to that place where she can have that relationship with the bridegroom and be purified before he returns because that she refuses to do it out of obedience so that it must eventually come by necessity. But my friend, we don't have to get there. We can stop it right now if we will determine, set our hearts to bow ourselves down, get shut in and cry out. Because the word of God says that when the righteous cry out, the Lord will hear and he will come down from his holy mountain. He will answer the cry of the bride. Get in the word of God, come into alignment with it, agree with it, Profess it, confess it, and start crying out to God. Get desperate because your desperation proves where your faith is. Because my friend, God in his mercy will strip you down to that place of desperation if you're not willing to get on your knees and cry out. And it's not because he wants to, but it's because he wants to get you to what he's promised you. And to get you there, he's going to have to take you through a Gethsemane so that you will pray. Can you not pray with me one hour? The Lord had to say to his closest followers. Why? Because they were not desperate in that moment. But let me tell you, after he was gone and it seemed like he was out of reach, reach then they became desperate and they got on their knees Jesus was desperate in that garden and he prayed and he pressed through and God strengthened him to do what he had called him to do because desperation will break through your doubt desperation will break through your theological blockages desperation will break through your logic desperation will break through your pride and all of the devil's lies desperation will connect you quick because it takes your mind and your will out of the way and sets your soul to crying out to God so that he can do all the things that you've been trying to do but could not do. He's just been waiting for you to get desperate enough to truly ask him to and to have faith that he can do what all these other things that you had faith in couldn't do. Desperation cries. Desperation makes time. Desperation speaks out. Don't tell me you don't have time to pray. You're just not desperate enough yet. Don't tell me that you can't say those things that you need to say to those people. You're just not desperate enough yet. Desperation has no shame, but it has all faith. Desperation prays and God responds to prayer, to fervent prayer. The fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. The word of God says that Elijah was a man of like passions, just like us. He was just like us. The only thing that set him apart and made him one of the greatest miracle workers of God, one of the greatest men of faith is that he had faith faith because he lived in a desperate time that required him to move in desperate faith that he would pray fervently what do you think a fervent prayer is it's a desperate prayer it's a prayer that breaks through that pushes through that doesn't have to be perfect or beautiful but it is powerful because there is a need David said when he faced Goliath and nobody else was willing to stand up he realized that his whole nation could be annihilated so in desperation he rose up and he said is there not a cause is there not a need you need to get desperate you need to get a revelation of how dire the situation really is so you will start praying the power in 
Because you can't buy the anointing. You can't program the anointing. You can't bribe the anointing. You can't invoke the anointing. You have to pray for the anointing. Like Samson did. My friend, the American church is like the church of Laodicea, which was enriched and full of goods and in need of nothing, not even their God. We just have too much to depend on. And because of that, sometimes God's got to strip us. I tell you, my friend, I think that many times we give the devil credit for things that God is doing because when hardships come and strippings come and disasters come and judgments come and we say, oh, that's the enemy. And in a way that's true because he has influenced it that has brought it upon us. But in reality, God has allowed it to begin to strip us that we might set our eyes and our focus back on him and away from all of the mammon and the things of the land. And the programs, I assure you, my friend, that if you will get desperate in prayer and pray with a heart of desperation and expectation, God will move and you will see miraculous manifestations. I promise you it is scriptural and I have seen it time and time again. It will not fail. God is faithful. He's just waiting for us to realize what we have really put our faith in. Before he'll step in and redirect our focus again. It's a shame that he has to. And I know it's not his desire to. But sometimes God's just got to strip you before he can truly use you. Because it's not until we reach that place of desperation. When we have nothing left to depend on. Or when we see the messes we've created from trusting everything else. We'll finally get desperate enough. To just offer ourself and say, God, it's not much. In fact, it's nothing. But I choose to put my faith in you to make something out of nothing. And then he says, that is what I'm waiting for. That's enough. That's all I need. Now I'm going to do what you couldn't do. I'm going to prove my glory through you. You see, my friend, when little David came up against Goliath, he was offered Saul's armor. Saul offered him the best armor. In fact, Saul would have probably been the only person in the entire land to own armor. This army, this Israelite army, they didn't even have a sword. There were only two swords in the entire land, which belonged to Saul and his son, Jonathan. That's why David ended up having to cut Goliath's head off with his own sword. God will use the very things that he exposes to you in the battle that you are fighting by faith to help to complete the battle, to destroy the enemy, and to prepare you for future battles because he kept that sword and he used Goliath's sword to win future battles. But you see, my friend, little David could have walked out there with Saul's armor. He could have said, well, you know, this is how it is. When you fight a battle, you put on armor. It makes sense. That's what everybody else does. But if he would have put on Saul's armor... When he would have walked out there, everybody would have recognized it and seen the armor and thought it was Saul. And then Saul would have gotten glory for what God wanted to do. So little David was faithful. He said, no, I'm going to go out with nothing but what the Lord has put within me, what the Lord has trained me in, what the Lord has put in my hand when I was out there in the middle of the wilderness and he gave me a rock. What is a rock but our Lord Jesus Christ? And it might be all I have, but I've used it to defend the flock. What is the flock but God's people? Against the lion and the bear, that great devourer that came to destroy. My Jesus has always been enough and my Jesus is still enough. And I'm going to take this giant down with just me and this rock. I'm not going to depend on Saul's armor because I don't want Saul getting glory for what God is going to do. If he would have taken that armor out there, his faith would have been in the armor and not in the Lord. Where is your faith, my friend? Because what you have faith in is what you're going to search out. And it's what the actions of your life are going to give glory to. Where is your faith? Is your faith in money or is it in God? Is it in material things or is it in God? Is it in people or personalities or is it in God? What are you seeking after to get the job done? Because that's what you really have faith in. When God gives you a promise or a mission or a commission or when you have a vision in your heart and you set forth to accomplish it, what do you seek out to get it done? 
Because if you're seeking out money to get it done, that's where your faith is. If you're spending most of your time looking for materials to get it done, then that's what your faith is in. If you're using most of your time to find the right people and personalities, then that's what your faith is in. But if you're spending most of your time in prayer, crying out to God in faithful obedience and intercession, then that's where your faith is to get the job done. So ask yourself today, what do you seek after to get the job done? Because that's where your faith really is. We have got to pray with desperation today that the church will stop substituting the presence for a presentation to cover up the fact that there is no yoke breaking anointing so that we have to distract and draw and dazzle by entertaining. I have faith in God and I pray that you profess it today out loud so that all the hordes of hell can hear it. I have faith in God and in the power of my Christ and in what he himself has equipped me with in my times of desperation so that I am not tempted or impressed by Saul's armor. I will not pick it up. I will not put it on. It has not been proven to work. Because if it worked, Saul would be out there using it to take out Goliath. It doesn't work. It has never worked. And it never will work. But God does. I choose to have faith in my God. But do you know why I can have faith in my God? Because I've seen how faithful he's been in my times of desperation. Just like little David. David had faith that God could take him out there with nothing but a rock. And defeat the enemy. Because that he had seen how faithful his God had been in all his times of desperation. He wasn't tempted to pick up Saul's armor. That Saul or his armor might get glory for saving that nation. It's very sad, but this is why nearly every revival throughout history and throughout scripture took place at a point at which judgment was being threatened upon a nation or they had already entered into it and the people through desperation had began to cry out to the Lord that he might step in to clean up their mess and help them get back on track. We see it in Nineveh in the scriptures, the greatest revival that the world has ever known. The entire nation got saved, repented in sackcloth and ashes. But it was because of the expectation of judgment that drove them to the desperation that was needed to push the people to pray. Jesus told his disciples to stay up and pray that the hour was dire, but they didn't believe him. So they kept falling asleep. They didn't have a revelation of the desperation of the situation. Because when you do, it will cause activation. It will break through your apathy. It will break through your unbelief. It will break through everything and get you on your knees. We need a people that will be desperate for revival. That will be desperate for the truth. That will be desperate for souls to be brought into the kingdom. That will be desperate enough to pray fervently. Because you see those disciples, they kept going to sleep. They wouldn't pray. They wouldn't pray. They didn't understand the direness of the hour. But when the time had come and judgment had begun to be poured out, out and Jesus stepped in the way and took our place and then they began to see uh oh it looks like he's not gonna be with us now there's a need now we're desperate my friend it's in those times when it seems like everything falls apart and everything works against us and we're crying out God where are you he doesn't seem to be there that we finally get desperate enough sometimes he's got to step back and show you what it's like to not have him covering you for you to get desperate enough to start trusting what he has to say and start praying again. I'm not fussing at you today, my friend. I'm trying to awaken a church to pray, to wake up, bride, wake up and be what the Lord has called you to be. I mean that corporately, but it also happens individually in those moments where it seems like he's so far away and, and everything is falling apart. We get desperate and we start to pray. But he doesn't want it to have to be that way. You see, it's in those spiritual winters, those hard seasons that we learn how to build that fire by necessity. 
and we learn how to keep that fire burning and we stay close to the fire but when things get good when that springtime comes and all of those seeds start coming to life and we start to see a harvest and things are going right we get away from the fire we stop building the fire there's not that much need for the fire and so what happens he has to allow another winter to come to drive us back to the fire but he doesn't want it to be so if you will keep the fire going if you will keep the desperation if you will keep that true prayer and intercession if you will keep that heart of fervency like Elijah did if you will keep calling the fire will keep fallen and he will not have to take you back into that place pray every day with desperation so that you can avoid going back into those desperate situations and we've got to pray for the church to wake up and recognize this and do the same so we can see him moving in this nation like we see him moving in desperate nations because the American church has got to stop organizing more than it is agonizing. We've got to return to fervent prayer. Where is your faith? What you are seeking out to get the job done determines where your faith is. Search your heart. People, when there's a need, what do you run to? What gets your energy? Because I don't want to have to depend on the works of man. I want to depend on the king of glory. I need him to step in. I don't need a check. Mammon isn't going to do what this nation needs. I don't need a performance. Entertainment isn't going to do what this generation needs. If it could, it would already be done just like Saul's armor. If that armor could win the fight, the fight would already be won. But it's not won. It's not worked. It's never worked and it's never going to work. We need a David who has been through desperate times, who has been through enough desperation to have had an activation of faith in the power of our God to do it through miraculous means. Because only in that will he step in because it assures that he gets the glory. We need a people with enough faith to set the stage for God to get the glory. God, we want to make it as impossible as possible so that in the end, all men will have to say that only God did this. I am praying with desperation, with fervency in my heart. God, move on this nation and this generation in a way that only you will get glory. And all will turn to you and will seek you. And they won't seek to mimic a movement or a man or mammon. But they will seek the face of God because we're not asking for your hands and what you can do for us. We are asking for your face to shine upon us, to transform us, to set this nation back in order. Lord, because you do everything decently and in order and there is an order and things are out of order. And God, we are desperate for you to set things right. And that desperation will drive my hands to fight. And we will cry. And we will call upon the name of the Lord. And we will trust you to step in and win this war. God, I believe it. You've done it before. And you will do it again. Because there is a desperation. There is a need. There is a cause in the land. And I will cry and I will plead with everything that is within me. And I will see your glory manifested again. I truly believe it. With all that is within me, will you believe it with me? Because real prayer, real fervent, desperate prayer changes things. Desperation breaks through apathy. Desperation breaks the spiritual laziness. Desperation breaks through unbelief. Desperation breaks through the defeatism that we have. Because maybe that you felt the glory. Maybe that you moved in some of this power before. Four, but there was a sin that crept in and it weakened your spiritual strength it blinded your vision and now you're walking in defeatism but desperation has a way of breaking that just like it did for Samson things didn't change for him until he got desperate you see Samson went from tearing down the very gates of the enemy to being led around captive by the very weakest of them a mere child among them could lead him by a leash because that he had been weakened and blinded by sin 
because he had walked in apathy. He had gotten so caught up in the culture that he didn't see the desperation of the state that his nation was in. And he began to partake in the sin that weakened him and blinded him. And then he lost his faith in the power of the anointing. My friend, I understand that once you mess up and you feel that glory depart, you know, I think it's one of the saddest scriptures in all of the Bible. There's a few like this that truly break my heart, but this is truly among the top when it says that Samson went out and shook himself like before, but he did not know that the Lord had departed. The anointing had lifted. The Holy Spirit had departed from him and he didn't even realize it. He went out and he did the same things and he went through the same motions and he put on the same performance, but nothing happened. There was no power in it. There was no yoke breaking anointing. He didn't even realize he had lost it. And once he lost it, it was so hard for him to have faith in it again. I understand you've been weakened and blinded by sin because that you have mixed yourself in the culture of the land. You didn't see the desperation of the situation, but my friend, I pray that God open our eyes again, that we might have an activation of faith in the power of the anointing to do what only God can do, what nothing of this culture can do, that everything that this culture has caused to blind and to weaken the church, the anointing would step in to destroy it, to crush it, to break the yoke of it in the name of Jesus. You see, Samson got put under a yoke. They took him in and they put him on a grain mill, a grinding stone. They put a yoke on his neck. You understand that this was usually the work of an ox, of an animal. They would yoke it up and tie it to this big stone and it would have to push this stone around and around and it would grind the wheat into flour. Do you understand that scripturally God's people were always represented by wheat? Samson was called by God to be anointed with a job and a mandate to destroy the enemy, to tear them down and to set his people in a place of rule and of authority that they might bring hope and blessing to the land. But because of sin, because he would not separate himself from the culture and the practices of the land that did not work but only provoked God to anger, was he blinded and put on this meal and caused to walk in circles the rest of his days, moving in circles, never getting anywhere or accomplishing anything. And instead of freeing God's people and empowering God's people he spent his days trampling the wheat which represented God's people to crush them into flour to be fed to the enemy Samson is a type of the church my friend we've got to stop being blinded by the sin of the culture and trying to mix in with it because it is stealing the anointing away from the church and it is creating a church that is bound under a yoke of bondage of the enemy that is doing nothing but going in circles and not getting anywhere not accomplishing anything and instead of freeing and empowering God's people and setting them in a place of authority and blessing it is causing them to be trampled under foot of the enemy, ground up, crushed down, made into bread to feed the very enemy that it was meant to overcome. To the point where he was led out blind and destitute by a child to be mocked and ridiculed by the enemy, by all the hordes of hell. And I assure you today, my friend, that the church of America is the laughing stock of hell. But it need not be so. Because in that moment, Samson finally got desperate. And the desperation of the situation caused an activation of faith. He remembered the anointing, that it's not about the culture, that it's not about the tools of the land, that it was a lack of faith faith and obedience to the word of God that got him in this place in the first place. And so he cried out with everything that was in him. His desperation broke through his fear. It broke through his unbelief. It broke through his apathy. It broke through his agreement with the enemy. And he cried out with everything that was within him. God anointed.
anoint me one more time even if it kills me and with that the anointing fell and it says that he destroyed more of the enemy in his dying than in his living the problem is is that the church isn't willing to sacrifice to lay down their life their pride their comfort their compromise their agreement with the enemy my friend if you are willing to be all in and find your place of desperation and begin to cry out and have faith in the anointing and the anointing only then God will step in and because you were willing to let your will die and stop trying to live in the culture of the time then you will defeat more of your enemy in your dying than you ever could in your living it's time that the church be willing to get on the cross of Jesus Christ it was desperation that broke his defeatism are you desperate how desperate are you because deliverance is for the desperate and I assure you my friend that this nation needs deliverance the church needs deliverance there's somebody in your family that needs deliverance but deliverance is for the desperate how desperate are you God, we are desperate. We are crying out with desperation, God. And I'm praying for an awakening in the name of Jesus that would pierce the hearts today and bring the people to a revelation of the desperation of the situation that we are in, that it might cause an activation of faith in the name of Jesus, that we might lay down our fear and our pride and our faith in every other thing and all the lies of the enemy and begin to speak out because the gates of hell cannot prevail against what is coming out of our mouth for it is the power of the church of Jesus Christ coming alive to fight against the strongholds of the enemy to retake the territory today we move in a Samson anointing to tear down the gates of the enemy because you see my friend from the beginning Samson took those gates on his back do you understand that those gates weighed between 5 and 10 tons and he carried them 45 miles that is something that cannot be done by the works of man and at that time not even any of their tools but it was done by the hand of the Lord God Almighty through an anointing we need an anointing that can do what no man can and what the tools of the land could never hope to counterfeit we need a real move we need the greater things we need the anointing and God I am desperate for it I am desperate enough to cry out for it I am all in for it and I will pray Samson's prayer Lord Lord, anoint me. I am willing to count the cost to pick up my cross and to follow after you. And I will put my faith and my heart wholly on you and not in the things of this land. You are the one that I'm going to cry out to. I'm going to give you most of my words. I'm going to give you most of my time. I'm going to dedicate most of my energy to prayer and to warfare because that is what's going to change things. That is what's going to bring the anointing. It doesn't matter how powerful polished it is it matters how powerful it is and you don't care about the presentation you care about those who are willing to cry out for the presence God we need your presence to step in we are praying for true revival I am praying for true awakening for a stirring of faith in the power of God but to do that you've got to break our faith in everything else so Lord I say strip us strip it down strip it down to the bare bones if you've got to clear the stage before you can set it then do what you've got to do because I want to see you glorified I want to see the real thing I want to see the nation awakened to the power of our God that there would be generations talking about what he did did you hear about their God it couldn't be counterfeited it couldn't be manufactured it couldn't be produced it proved the fruitlessness of the culture by proving how limited it was to counterfeit the power of the kingdom the real king the king is here God we want the world to know that you are God and you are God alone make yourself known Step down off your throne and into your congregation and revive them by your holy visitation. 
we are the church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Samson was a type for the church, the anointed church and the gates of the enemy could not prevail against him. He tore them down. God, we need that anointing. But because he refused to separate himself from the culture of the land, he lost the anointing because you could not endorse his sin anymore or his mixture therein. God, give me a people that are going to stand firm on your word and have faith and be the true church that the gates of hell would not prevail against them, that they would be territory takers, that they would be nation shakers. That they would be yoke breakers. Give me a church that is anointed. Not weakened by sin or blinded by the culture that they've been in. But a people who will be desperate enough to cry out. God send your anointing again. We are all in and we are willing to pray that prayer with you Jesus. We count the cost and we pick up our cross and we say not our will but thy will be done. We come to the altar not for vain glory but we come to it to die. That we might see more of the enemy defeated in our dying than in our living. Because true men and women of God are all in and they are willing to contend for souls not for stages. Lord, awaken this Joshua generation that is willing to stand in the land and profess as they possess. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord and we shall not compromise with the culture. We don't need the tools of the enemy to win souls. We don't need Saul's armor. The gospel works just fine. We're just not really using it because our faith is in so many other things in mammon in prosperity, in vainglory, in Saul's armor. My friend, I got to share something with you today. I was on Facebook this morning putting out the post for yesterday's podcast and I saw this advertisement and it caused a righteous indignation to stir up within me. It was an advertisement for a sermon app. And in the advertisement, it talked about how one of the most difficult things for preachers today is for them to get an engaging word that will keep the attention of the people every week. And so for that, you need to get this app because it will give you sermons and make it easy for you. My friend, it was never meant to be easy to carry the anointing, to carry the presence of God. In fact, God commanded that the ark be carried on the shoulders of priests, that they bear the burden and the weight of the presence of God. But David, he thought, oh, I'm going to make this a little easier for them. I'm going to put this thing on a cart and we're going to drag it behind us and it's going to go where we tell it to go. My friend, you get on your knees and you get under the weight of his glory because when David did that, God got angry and a man died for it and blood ended up on their hands. It was never meant to be easy to carry the burden of the presence of God. We're trying to drag the presence of God around with us instead of letting it lead us, instead of carrying the weight of it, instead of getting into that prayer closet. Are you kidding me? It's hard to get one sermon a week. The Lord has been pouring out a sermon every single day. So far, we're halfway through 120 days. We've already covered more than a year's worth of Sunday morning service since we began this prayer campaign. The word of the Lord will come forth if you will get on your face before him. If you're not able to get a sermon a week easily, then it's because you're not praying. You're not ministering unto the Lord. You're just checking into a job. The Lord will pour revelation and his word will come forth. We are just a vessel. You don't need the tools of the culture to tell you what to say or what to do. When you yield yourself to the spirit of God, his word will come through you. I just open my mouth and he fills it. Am I telling you that this is easy? No, it is a pressing. It is a crushing. I get on my knees and I bear the burden and the weight of the glory of the presence of God. But when the presence flows, it flows. It can be done. It's not supposed to be easy. He wants a people that are willing to pick up their cross and bear it. He wants a people that are all in. He wants a people he can depend on. He wants a people that are willing to be led by the presence, not to drag it around behind them. He's not going where we're going. We've got to be willing to go where he's going. Lord, give me a people that are desperate and break the apathy that leads a nation to be able to say, 
that it's hard to get one sermon a week because the pastors are not praying. It's time for a reformation. Father, we're asking that you start from the ground up. Lay the foundations of biblical truth and raise up a people who are surrendered to you, who have faith in you that they might walk in the true grace of your power and see the manifestations of the greater things that are stored up for this hour because you were born for such a time as this we hear so much about the great revivals of the past the great generals of faith the miraculous things that they walked in but my friend their time has come and gone you were born for such a time as this and in every generation there has been a demonstration if there is no demonstration in your generation then it's time you get desperate for it and start crying out like Samson did God anoint me because I am willing to lay it all down that I might see more more of the enemy defeated in my dying than in my living. If you are willing to die to self, you will come alive spiritually like you've never experienced and you will see the greater things manifested in this earth. God, show us your glory. Do you understand that when Moses prayed that prayer, show us your glory? How many times do we sing it? Oh God, show us your glory. But we're really saying, God, we want to have your glory. Show the world our glory. Let everybody see your glory fall on us that we might get glory from it. But he's saying, no, I'm still standing at the door knocking because I will not share my glory with another. When Moses prayed that prayer, Lord, show me your glory. He understood that to see the face of God meant that he would die. What he was really saying is, God, one moment in your presence is worth my life. I want to see your glory, even if it kills me. No matter what it takes, I'm all in. I'm willing to lay it all down. It's not about me. It is for your glory. Show it to me only for a moment. Anoint me one more time, even if it kills me. Desperation. God, give us a heart of desperation that we might cry out for a true demonstration for the sake of this generation. Because I truly believe if there is not a mighty move of God to show forth his reality in this earth, that we cannot make it through another generation before the faith of this nation is completely annihilated. This generation needs to see a demonstration that they might believe the things that they have heard from people past demonstrations that they might even be able to believe what they read in the word they need to see it proven in the earth and I need a people that are desperate enough to cry out for it day and night God bring a wave of truth shine your light on the darkness that is manifesting in this land move with the holy visitation that they might see and believe again and go back to the word and read and understand that you are still the same you never change you've just been waiting for a people that are desperate enough to release faith because their faith is in every other thing but the king we are the church of Laodicea a church that is deceived and enriched full of goods and in need of nothing not even our king God I need you I'm desperate I am desperate and I am desperately pleading send your spirit We will follow its leading. Speak your word. We want to hear it. Lay out your truth. We will tremble before it and fear it that we might move in wisdom and not in our own righteousness. God, I'm desperate enough to believe. And because of that, I have been blessed enough to see. But God, I'm praying in faith with all my brothers and sisters that you pierce the hearts today, that they would pick up this mantle and pray fervently, desperately, daily, intently, and patiently wait upon the deliverance of the Lord. Because when the righteous cry out, the Lord God will come down from his holy mount and we will see what we have been needing. The King of glory is coming. Shine a light, Lord, on the things that we have given our faith bring revelation and truth that the only way we can be an influence to the world as salt should be an influencing agent in the culture 
is if we do not mix with it, but that we stand and contend against it in faith, in prayer, in declaration, that when you move, they might say, this is truth, because it's not what I'm used to, because only God could do what has been done. A little David and a rock, which is our Lord, the rock of our salvation, is enough to take out any power or principality over any nation if a people truly have faith. I wholeheartedly believe that God has been desiring to bring revival, to bring reformation, to bring correction and redirection, but I believe that every time that he has tried, the people have relied on Saul's armor so that he could not step in to endorse it because he will not give Saul the glory. He's still waiting for that one who will have faith enough to step out with nothing so that God can turn it in to the new thing for his glory with his fingerprint of approval, his endorsement on it, which are always miracles. Lord, I am desperate and only the desperate will see the deliverer and the miracles that he uses to bring deliverance. Are you willing to take your place in this? Because I need a people that are truly desperate.